In 1979, this man, Deng Xiaoping, became China's paramount leader. He said, socialism does not mean shared poverty. This was code for the most radical reform since Mao's revolution, the return of capitalism to China, but this time controlled by the Communist Party. To be rich is glorious, Deng was reported as saying. America was now threatened by the emergence of a vast image of itself. This is one of the many very exclusive gated communities in Shanghai, where an apartment is one of the prizes of the new communism. I had arranged to see Professor Zhang Wei Wei, a close aide to the late Deng Xiaoping, the man who changed China. Deng is um, uh, really extremely uh, long-term visionary, a leader with uh, exceedingly long-term and uh, strategic vision for his country, uh, for his people. And China is still following that path. Yeah. Actually, this is uh, really a tradition from China's yes. long history. You look at even like Mao, you know, he said, yeah. we should, you know, surpass UK uh, yeah. by which year, we should surpass the United States yes. by which year. So this tradition continues to this day. Even Xi Jinping today is also doing the same. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Actually, what many Chinese uh, have problem with Western media is the stereotypes about China. If you are, uh, you uh, content with stereotypes, you miss so many things, you know. If BBC broadcasts something, they are happy to always mention this communist dictatorship, this autocracy. No, actually, with this kind of label, you know, you cannot understand this China as it is. But if you uh, watch BBC or CNN yes. or read Economist and try to understand China, it will be a failure. <laughs> it's impossible. Multiple parties fight for political power and everyone voting on them as the only path to salvation to the long-suffering developing This is world. Eric Lee, a Shanghai entrepreneur, educated in America, do not and typical of a fail. new, confident, outspoken time, political deny. class. Now in China, uh, there are a lot of problems. Uh, but at the moment, the Chinese, the party state, has proven an extraordinary ability to change. I mean, I make the joke how in America you can change political parties, but you can't change the policies. In China, you cannot change the party, but you can change policies. Uh, so in the 65 or 66 mm. years, China is being run by one single party, yet the, the political changes that have taken place in China in this past 66 years uh, have been wider and broader and greater than probably any other major country in modern memory. So in that time, China ceased to be communist. Is that what you're saying? Well, China is a market economy, and it's a vibrant market economy, but it is not a capitalist country. Here's why. There's no way a group of billionaires could control the Politburo, as billionaires control American policymaking. So in China, you have a vibrant market economy, but capital does not rise above political authority. Capital is not, does not have enshrined rights. In America, capital, the interest of capital, and capital itself has risen above the, na the American nation. The political authority cannot check the power of capital. And that's why America is a capitalist country, but China is not. This is the ironic title of a best-selling book by Zhang Lijia, a journalist and critic who lives in Beijing. Many Americans imagine that the Chinese people live a miserable, repressed life with no freedom whatsoever. That's not quite true. If you talk, speak to many ordinary 
Chinese people, they will tell you they feel their life are quite free. Some 500 million people being lifted out of poverty, and some would say probably 600 million people. That's a, a great achievement. For many Americans, the yellow peril has never left them. Mm -hmm. I think the, there's a the fear about China. Of course, there's a the fear of China's rapid rise, but it also has a lot to do uh, with uh, China's uh, the label as a communist and state. China's objectives are modest. Mm -hmm. Compare with their weight. They're not trying to run the world. They're not even trying to run Asia Pacific. I think they want to keep America from dominating the Asia Pacific. So they have what they believe is their rightful place in Asia Pacific because of long civilization, long history, and their size. Um, so their objectives are really modest compared with their capacity. The, the wealth, the new wealth in China, mm -hmm. they often say this is, this is the product of mm -hmm. self-made entrepreneurial mm -hmm. skill. Yeah. But is it not also the product of the exploitation of people at the bottom. What are known in China as migrants, but they're not really migrants, they're Chinese. <laughs> if you really, you know, uh, go to talk to these migrant workers, uh, you will find quite surprisingly, over the past five to seven years, they have experienced uh, greater income increase than any other social groups. China not a class society. But China is a class society. These are the homes of migrant workers, people who build and service the new China. Here, it's not uncommon for three families to share one tiny flat. You know, you would associate a socialist country with, eco with equality, but uh, unfortunately, since the reform has started, China has become one of the most unequal societies in the world. The income gap is widening. Government, I feel, have retreated some of the responsibilities left the market to take over, but the market does not always treat women kindly. Some um, private companies, they would just refuse to hire um, child-bearing age women. And sometimes yeah. when women become pregnant, they will sack them because they don't want to pay the maternity leave. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the income gap has um, grown much bigger uh, between men and women. Your old boss, Tang Zeping presided over the bloodshed in Tiananmen Square. What would you say to the survivors of Tiananmen Square? Because so many of those did fight for what they saw as democratic change in China. In 1989, there were two political forces. One was those represented by the Chinese students their hero was Mihai Gorbachev, who happened to be in Beijing. Mm -hmm. you know? Their slogan was, Soviet Union's today, China's tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So the idea was political reform first, other reform second. Otherwise, China would be hopeless. Yeah. And Deng's message was the opposite. He thought Gorbachev was an idiot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He thought, you know, China must have economic reform first, other reform second. This priority must be set clearly. Unfortunately, at that particular moment in 1989, the two political forces could not reach a compromise. So definitely a tragedy occurred, yeah. It was more than a tragedy, it was a massacre, of which the memory remains a raw presence in modern China. Why does the Chinese state still fear the few, the few who speak out? And I'm thinking of... Mm. Liu Xiaobo. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, this man won the Nobel Peace Prize, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and he's in prison. He's violating the Chinese law, you know, by a big margin. So 
actually the freedom of expression, similar views are aired by many people, but he's really going to the extreme. Liu Xiaopo challenged the government to implement democratic reforms and has spent a total of 13 years in prison. Why can't a confident China accept a criticism like this? So, Nobel Peace Committee makes huge mistake. They owe the Chinese an explanation. If you cross the line, cross, you violate the Constitution, you violate so many laws, you should be punished. And yet in China today, the spirit of protest and dissent lives on in different forms. In 2015, strikes and community protests and activism reached record levels. This resistance is seldom reported in the West. So there are lots of protests in China. Uh, typically, for example, land being grabbed by officials to, for commercial development, and the farmers are not being compensated properly. Yeah. But the farmers now know more aware of their rights, so they protest. Or young workers from the factory, they demand a better wage or better, mm. better working condition. But many of the protests, they are economic driven, yeah. not political driven. They are regional, not national wide. So this kind of things will unlikely develop into a real movement or so-called, you call that, revolution. Yeah. Yeah. So the Mao's revolution was the last revolution? <laughs> well, I never say never. <laughs> the Japanese island of Okinawa is occupied by 32 military installations. From here, the United States has attacked Korea, Vietnam, Cambodia, Afghanistan, Iraq. The sky is full of planes and helicopters. Wherever people go, they are fenced in and told to keep out. Okinawa is the front line of a beckoning war with China. <laughs> Aged 87, Fumiko Shimabukuro is one of the leaders of a non-violent resistance that's challenging Washington's pivot to Asia. で、あの、カメラ引き落とそう。Fumiko is a survivor. A quarter of the civilians on the island were killed in the American invasion in 1945, and a fear of war has been passed through the generations. Today, those who witness these horrors live in a place of extraordinary beauty, surrounded by coral reefs and a unique marine life. It was here in Hinoko Bay 
that the survivors of World War II sought refuge. And it's this they're now fighting to save. It's an epic struggle that pits these island people against the greatest military power on Earth. This is the office of a former governor of Okinawa, Oto Masahide. What he has done is create not so much a museum, but an appeal to the outside world to understand the resistance in Okinawa, to understand the suffering, to read its hidden history. It begins in 1945 when the Americans invaded here is General MacArthur arriving in Okinawa. A second invasion happened 10 years later in what became known as the Bulldozers and Bayonets Campaign. American forces seized prime agricultural land, burned farmhouses and killed livestock. The dispossessed people of Okinawa marched the length of Japan, appealing for help. This wall is devoted to a resistance in Okinawa that never ceases. Everywhere people go on the island, they are confronted by this sign. It tells them they must not go past this fence topped with barbed wire. These fences run like great ribbons across the island, and the bases themselves cut swathes across Okinawa. But all around them are people with this continuing demonstration, this continuing resistance. And they have a message. It's people of the world. Watch what Japan and the US are doing. Don't let them force the bases on Okinawa. Okinawa <laughs> アメリカに対してはっきり物を言ってない。アメリカにもいい顔、沖縄にもいい顔をしてる。だからそれに対して腹が立って、ちゃんとアメリカにものを言ってくれという気持ちでいます。まあ、だからそこにここに呪言のホ
resented this unprecedented challenge to its authority. The issue is now in the Japanese courts. Japan's Prime Minister, Shinzo Abe, has also made clear that with the backing of his powerful patron America, he wants to reawaken Japanese nationalism and reclaim its military power. While we were filming this ceremony outside the base, on a day when people paid respect to their departed loved ones, giant American helicopters circled above us, intimidating as always. The threat of these low-flying aircraft is a constant presence in Okinawa. Teachers often can't teach because of the noise and the fear. This was the carnage when an American fighter crashed into a primary school after the pilot had ejected to safety Haru Akira, eight seven, was terribly burned. これはあの、十、十時半頃かな。それであの、メソルだったから。ましたさんがな、その方が石川に教授で行った教授でいますので、宮森校に行ったんだけど、どこにいるかわからなかったんですよ、その当時。それであの人から明らくんは病院、粒病院に行ったよという、あの人が明らは地にいますよと言ってそれでして行ったからあの焼けが焼けているようにして焼けと。え、焼けてもう人目も見るだけにも苦しくてもまったくあの焼け焼き
This is a MACE missile designed to carry a nuclear warhead. During the Cold War, the United States secretly installed nuclear weapons at this launch pad in Okinawa. Most of them were aimed at China. Today, the nuclear missile site is run by a Buddhist organization, the Soka Gakkai, as a peace museum. In 1962, the atomic weapons rolling on the missile was mm. almost launched. They're almost launched? Yeah. According to the uh, spokesman of this military base, said they were ordered to prepare then uh, received second order to stop it. One of the American servicemen, whose job was to fire the MACE missiles, has since revealed that China was a nuclear target during the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962. We were told that we had to launch all the missiles, but we only had one missile headed towards Russia, and we did not see why we should have to involve the other countries. The captain suggested that uh, everybody crack the doors open, so it would take less time to launch a missile if the doors were cracked open. One of the launch crews was on the point of firing their missiles when a duty officer suspected the order was false. The launch officer on the B side was told to send two men over there with 45s and to shoot anybody that tried to launch until the situation was resolved. And it would only take like 15, 20 seconds to run the distance between the, the two uh, command centers. So those two men kept that whole crew at bay uh, while we made a decision as to what to do. And it wasn't very long, maybe two or three seconds later, where a very nervous major came over the intercom uh, issuing the uh, stand down order. And then we just kind of looked at each other. Like we could have exterminated the whole planet. The major who had given the launch order was quietly court martialed and dismissed from the Air Force. That morning is just as familiar to me and as clear as yesterday morning is. And this is 53 years later, and how clear and blue the sky was. And it was just some very light clouds, and there was a perfect breeze blowing, and a perfect temperature. I did not know what the temperature was, but it just felt perfect. And we were all just kind of taking it in and taking in the smell of the air and the sea and the land mixture together, and everything smells so beautiful. This is very interesting because it shows the cities mm -hmm. in China right. where these MACE missiles were yeah, aimed which, at. Yes. Which, which ones do we have here? This is Okinawa Island. So uh, within 2,000 kilometers, you find Peking or Beijing, Xi'an, UK, and Hong Kong, Shanghai, tai, uh, it's Taiwan, Taipei, and uh, Pyongyang, North Korea, within the range of missile. This is the work of the Okinawan sculptor Kinjo Manuru. It's a tribute to the suffering and resistance of the people of this island.
more than a thousand miles away on the Korean island of Jeju. These symbols of struggle are hauntingly similar. The work of Korean sculptor Ko Gilchun represents another fight of island people for freedom. A semi-tropical sanctuary of unusual beauty, Jeju Island is a World Heritage Site. The government of South Korea declared it an island of world peace. But on this island of peace has been built one of the most provocative military bases in the world, less than 400 miles from Shanghai. Like Okinawa and the Marshall Islands, this is America's front line in its so-called pivot to Asia. Here in once unspoiled Ganjung village, the South Korean Navy has built a base for American aircraft carriers, nuclear submarines, and destroyers equipped with the Aegis ballistic missile aimed at China's defenses. China's lifelines to the world in oil, trade, resources, depend on shipping that comes through choke points like this. The U.S. pivot into the Asia-Pacific is really intended to create the ability to put a loaded gun to the head of China and say, you know, uh, you will do as we say, otherwise we will be able to restrict, we will be able to shut down, choke off your importation of oil and other resources. For nine years, every day, often twice a day, these Catholic priests have staged a mass that blocks the gates of the new military base on Jeju Island. In a country where political demonstrations can be easily banned, unlike powerful religions, the tactic has produced this spectacle of resistance. Father Moon Jong Hoon has led the fight to stop the base being built and several times suffered serious injury. I sing four songs every day before mass, during the mass, at the end of the mass, and uh, the end of the rosary. Yeah. Uh, the, the content of the song is very beautiful. The, the writer and the composer is uh, the musician from this island. Oh. So I love oh. him very much. Oh. And he gave me the song oh. that I practice. And I became a master to sing that song because I practice every day. Well, you, you sing it with such <laughs> passion. <laughs> Sometimes we just wait. Typhoon, you know, typhoon <laughs> struck. <laughs> do you sing then? Do you, do you have a mass when the typhoon strike? Oh, yes. During this. No exception. What will happen 
if this base becomes operational? They have uh, destroyed the environment, destroyed the life of villagers. No, we should be witness of that uh, oppression and mm. violence, you know. Why do they do it? Well, they'd like to rule the Pacific area, whole area, right? They'd like to make China isolated in this globe. Yeah. You know? It means U.S. government want to be emperor of this world. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, a Quaker called Mr. O joins them with his own ritual of protest, accompanied by an artist called Wildflower. Ochoa 선생님이 삼보일배를 하다 보면 이렇게 바닥에 숙여야 되잖아요. 그 차들이 올때못볼수 있어요. 매우 위험하죠. 그래서 제가 뒤에서 좀 눈에 띄게 이렇게 하고 있으면 그런 교통 사고를 막을 수도 있고요. 저도 제 바느질이 명상이라고 생각하거든요. 어, 실제로 그 뇌파가 명상할 때 거의 비슷해요. 바느질 할 때. 저는 저거 저 해군 기지가 명백하게 미국의 전쟁 기지라 생각해요. 그래서 배치와 더불어서 아, 우리나라 한반도 남쪽, 전쪽, 서쪽 서쪽으로 미군 기지가 들어 있어요. 그래서 저는 이 제주가 마지막 이섬섬이 서해안 쪽으로 전쟁 벨트를 지었는데 그 벨트의 맨 마지막이라 생각을 해요. 그 당연히 이거는 중국이 겨냥하고 있기 때문에 중국과의 분쟁 또는 동 이쪽 동북아의 평화를 정말 위협할 수 있는 그런 기지라서 이게 가장 큰 위험이라고 생각을 해요. This is the center of an empire that never speaks its name, whose power is represented in this extraordinary world map of American military bases. Four thousand bases in the United States, almost a thousand bases spread across every continent. The archipelago of empire, uh, the bases that we have around the world, hidden in plain sight, are the, the real territory of our empire. Uh, but at the same time, we maintain independent governments in Japan or South Korea or Germany. Uh, they don't have autonomy when it comes to foreign policy. So it's a very sophisticated and effective system uh, where, whereby we pat ourselves on the back for uh, helping to midwife uh, democracy in Japan and Germany and South Korea and various other places, while keeping the lid on uh, in, in that we don't know what these countries would do if they were fully independent. And, and the beauty of this system is that most people pay no attention to it at all. They think it's just a natural occurrence to have uh, 50,000 American troops in, in Japan. The, there's no country that has better anti-imperial credit uh, cred than uh, the United States, and we are not trying to recreate the glories of the uh, the British Empire. We're arguing that the world is round. We have a global policy, and all nations have global rights. No ocean has ever been dominated the way the U.S. dominates the Pacific. Navy and Air Force, uh, they claim at, in the uh, Pearl Harbor headquarters of the uh, Pacific Command, they claim to be responsible for 52% of the Earth's uh, surface. And when you look at their uh, logo, it shows uh, an eagle over the Aleutian Islands with one tail on coming down somewhere near Seattle and the other coming down right over Beijing. So uh, Beijing uh, looks at a network of bases, a real archipelago of empire that's been built up since the Korean War. You have had, and still have, an arc of, 
of bases that start in Australia and go through the no. Pacific. We have no bases in Australia. You have Pine Gap, you have Darwin, and you no. have a new facility in Western Australia. No, uh, to speak precisely, we, we have no military bases in Australia. What we do is uh, operate with and in Australian bases. Yeah. But we're not in the basing business nowadays. There's a growing collection of what are referred to as lily pad bases. Mm. Um, these are bases that have typically two, 300 troops, um, no family members, very few amenities, and are often quite secretive. They're bases that are frequently constructed within a foreign country's base to disguise it, um, and, and generally are not referred to as bases. Many of these bases have been set up to combat China's worldwide economic influence. From these bases, the United States operates a secret army in 147 countries. If you're going to be a free country rather than give in to every gangster regime in the world, you're going to have to take a risk because those gangsters, they want to they, they want to eliminate good people in the world so they can, uh, uh, and, and in China, they want to dominate all of, the, all of the Far East. They want to dominate, just like Japan wanted to before World War II, their goal was to dominate that part of the world. Today, the, because there has been no political reform in Beijing, these guys want to dominate a huge chunk of the planet. Twilight struggle. Andrew Kropenovich served on America's Soviet National CIA Defense Panel. He's a military strategist and war planner. You've written that airstrikes and naval blockades have a, a role to play in punishing China. You've described the need for sea mines. You've described the need for special forces, U.S. special forces, and missiles placed in islands. This sounds like a preparation for war. Um, our, our first president, George Washington, said, if you want peace, prepare for war. And essentially, uh, what the United States is doing, again, is responding to provocative behavior uh, on the part of China. And just as we did in the Cold War, the idea was uh, to have a position of military strength such that your adversaries were not tempted to act uh, in aggressive ways or try and employ coercion to get their way. I mean, just last week, the U.S. Navy sent a guided missile destroyer into the mm -hmm. Spratly Islands and South China Sea. And what was different about this, I think, was that Chinese fighters scrambled. That sounds like an escalator. Well, the, uh, again, from an American perspective, the, the escalation was the Chinese beginning to militarize these islands in the first place, uh, moving uh, its military capabilities down into that region, uh, engaging in provocative behavior against uh, the commercial activities and, and military um, forces of, of other minor countries in the region that have claim to those islands. Mm -hmm. So it's a response to Chinese intimidation. Uh, rather, how, uh, excuse me. How how is commerce being intimidated in the South China Sea? There have been no military mm. forces, no military bases there. Uh, the Chinese, except the United States military base, not in the South China Sea, well, and not even in, in the Philippines, in, in, because the United States withdrew its forces in the Philippines. But the United States is back in the Philippines. The Philippines and the United States have announced five different locations scattered all throughout the Philippines where U.S. troops will be stationed on a rotational basis. This threat to China from yet more U.S. bases on its doorstep was not an issue when an arbitration tribunal ruled against China's claims to the strategic Spratly Islands in the South China Sea. In 2015, the U.S. Navy rehearsed a blockade that would cut China's lifelines of oil and trade and raw materials. The danger of confrontation grows by the day. The US Navy is on the doorstep of China, regardless of disputed islands, and is there with low draft ships, planes, mm -hmm. battle groups. It's right on the doorstep. What if Chinese ships, what if the equivalent was off California. 
Well, John, we ask ourselves that question regularly, and it's it's important to put yourself in the other guy's shoes. Yeah. Uh, so look, we don't operate in the Pacific in an effort to scare China, to contain China, to backfoot China. Our operations uh, and our presence first of all, is warmly welcomed by the vast majority of the coastal states, but secondly, is fully accepted by the Chinese. Time after time... Is it, excuse me, is it fully accepted? Yes. My impression... By their, by their words. The Chinese My impression leaders, is that they're scared. And this is what they're scared of, a noose of bases right around China. Missiles, bombers, drones, warships, a provocation of war. Today, I state clearly and with conviction, America's commitment to seek the peace and security of a world without nuclear weapons. Under Obama, nuclear warhead spending has risen higher than under any president since the end of the Cold War. It's all a magician's show because at the same time that Obama is talking about that, not only is he spending a trillion dollars to modernize U.S. nuclear forces, but he's deploying these missile defense systems to encircle Russia and China, which makes it impossible to get rid of nuclear weapons in that climate. Everybody wants to look like they're tough. See, I got to be tough. I got to show you, I, you know, I'm not afraid of doing anything military. I'm not afraid of threatening. I'm, you know, I'm a hairy chested gorilla. And, uh, you know, and you don't want to look like you're weak. So what you do is you talk more and more aggressively and, uh, and you let, and if you don't want to do it yourself, because you maybe think it doesn't look very presidential, you let somebody under you do the talking. And we have gotten into a state the United States has gotten into a situation where there's a lot of military, uh, you know, saber rattling, yeah. and it's really being orchestrated from the top. Yeah. This seems incredibly dangerous, all of this. That's an understatement, I think, but I agree. Yeah. <laughs> when you routinely plan for mass murder, you become conditioned to it. That's what this is. We accept it. Oh, yeah, we have, we have nuclear weapons. The Defense Secretary, he's just announced that there will be warships and special forces and planes sent to the Philippines. And the Wall Street Journal has described this as the vanguard of a major U.S. presence in Southeast Asia. That sounds like... Where does this end? What's the, what's the purpose? I mean, where are we going to stop this process before it starts a war? And then if the war starts, where does that end? scientific studies that I teach by the scientists that predict that the earth can be made essentially uninhabitable from nuclear war, the scientists have been begging the Obama administration, well, they wouldn't say begging, but they've made multiple requests to meet with them and discuss these predictions because they're peer-reviewed studies and they've been turned down over and over again. They've been peripherally told that, well, we don't think uh, the long-term environmental consequences of nuclear war are all that important if the immediate effects of nuclear war don't stop it. But the long-term environmental consequences of nuclear war are liable to wipe out the human race. In one exchange, nuclear exchange between the U.S. and China, what could be the consequences? Well, let me just give you an example of what one Chinese four or five megaton warhead would do to a city in the United States if it got through. 
the detonation of that weapon over a city would instantly ignite about six or seven hundred square miles on fire. And, and within 20 to 30 minutes, all of those fires would coalesce into a single gigantic firestorm. There would be no escape from it, so all the people there would perish. So the U.S. with, say, hundreds of nuclear weapons on Chinese cities. Well, when you combine all the smoke from these nuclear weapons detonating, it actually creates millions of tons of smoke, black carbon smoke, will rise above cloud level into the stratosphere. It's heated by the sun, it acts like a solar collector. And that smoke, because of that, will stay there for 10 years or longer. And what the smoke does is it blocks warming sunlight from reaching the surface of the Earth. And it becomes so cold in a matter of just a couple of weeks that will, the temperatures will fall below freezing every day for one to three years. And it will become too cold to grow food crops for at least 10 years or longer. I mean, there's, there's like a total disconnect with the changing world. You have a giant rising power, in this case, China. Why would you expect a giant rising power to not want to have more control over its destiny? What we should be doing, in my view, is trying to cultivate a sense of uh, friendship and cooperation, and we can have our differences with them. If we think they're doing something in trade that we don't like, let's have it out with them. But this saber rattling is the worst thing we can possibly do. to show the whole world that America is back, bigger and better and stronger than ever before. We don't have victories anymore. We used to have victories, but we don't have them. When was the last time anybody saw us beating, let's say, China in a trade deal? They kill us. We can't continue to allow China to rape our country, and that's what they're doing. It's the greatest theft in the history of the world. The new president, Donald Trump, has a problem with China. The urgent question now is, will Trump continue with the provocations revealed in this film and take us all to the edge? of war. There never have been two countries more interdependent on each other than China and the U.S. in history. Uh, and China is the largest trading nation in the world and in history. So China's economy and, and, and their society and their lives are, 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 are linked to the entire world including America and the West and all, and all the other countries. So, so I think interdependence between these two countries and among all the nations of the world um, speak to peace. We don't have to accept the word of those who conjure up threats and false enemies that justify the business and profit of war if we recognize there is another superpower. And that's us, ordinary people everywhere, like the people of Okinawa, Jeju Island, the Marshall Islands, China, the United States. By speaking out, they deliver a warning to all of us. Can we really afford to be silent? We'll meet again Don't know where Don't know where but I know we'll meet again some sunny day. Keep smiling.
smiling through Just like you always do Till the blue skies drive the dark clouds far away So will you please say hello To the folks that I know Tell them I won't be long They'll be happy to know That as you saw me go I was singing this song We meet again Don't know when Don't know when But I know we'll meet again Some sunny day 